Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Hart. I am the Associate Director and the Barbara C. and Harvey P. Hood 1918 Curator of Academic Programming. Um, and I just wanted to give everybody a reminder if they have a cell phone to turn it off now. Um, uh, okay. Um, this afternoon, it is my great pleasure to introduce Christine Lilliquist, the Metropolitan Museum of Art's former head of the Department of Egyptian Art and Lila Atchison Wallace Research Curator in Egyptology and recent advisor and, and also an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation visiting scholar at the Hood Museum of Art. Dr. Lindquist curated the current exhibition that's on view upstairs of the Hood's Egyptian antiquities, the majority of which had never been on view prior to this installation. We have used them for teaching, but we just hadn't had them on view. Um, and she served as a wonderful advisor to us on this project on not only the mounting and conservation of these objects, um, but also the scholarship. Um, uh, and for several years, I think it's been about five or six years <laughs> now, she's been working on cataloging uh, um, uh, the collection and applying her great knowledge of this area to looking at it as a whole and all its aspects, as you will see when she gives her lecture. And she hopes to finish this coming winter on the cataloging project after she and her husband relocate to Vermont. So welcome, welcome to Vermont. Dr. Lilliquist's final project at the Metropolitan Museum of Art is a website publication of an excavation undertaken 100 years ago when the Earl of Carnarvon and the Metropolitan Museum had adjoining excavations at Thebes. Um, her wish was, we, <laughs> we wish her very well on her work for this project because I know it's, a, it's been a long time in the making. This is the second lecture she's given on Dartmouth's Egyptian collection. The previous one focused on the objects, and for this lecture, she turns to the creation of the collection. The title of today's lecture is Causing Their Names to Live, Collectors, Scholars, Dealers, and the Hood's Egyptian Objects. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. I'm grateful again to the hood for the opportunity to have researched these objects. It's always a great pleasure to find new things and to learn about them. And since so many of the things here are without provenance, I ended up spending quite a bit of time trying to find out how they had come into the hood, what year, from where, um, because sometimes that helps us determine the ancient location of the object as well as um, the time period or the context that it might have come out of. So um, there's another reason to actually to look at provenance and history of objects and that is that one of the ways that the ancient Egyptians obtained mortality was through preserving their names on monuments or speaking them and this evening I want to call attention to those collectors, scholars, and ordinary folk who have had a role in keeping interest in Egypt alive. And we will speak of some of their names tonight as we learn how they came to own or study the objects which we now have here. Some people own an Egyptian object out of curiosity. In the 19th century, from the time of Napoleon, about 1800, the lure of the exotic brought Europeans, British, and Americans to an Egypt that was remarkably preserved from ancient times. This is a, a watercolor of David Roberts around 1820 in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, there are some openings there, but very little else to tell you what really lay behind that. There was an interest in the natural world at that time in the early 19th century in foreign peoples and places. We know it from the Fleming Museum in St. Johnsbury or this more uh, grand scale cabinet of curiosities in Oxford, the Pitt Rivers Museum. You may remember from the first lecture, oops, this one, that I pointed out two small fragments here uh, on the left. One of them actually we found fits 
in a royal tomb of about 1200 BC. These were certainly picked up as curiosities by the mineralogist um, Frederick Hall, who was a renowned scientist who taught at Dartmouth and elsewhere. He built a vast mineralogical collection and included specimens from Europe in his mineralogy pursuits, but he also collected these two small fragments as curiosities. This foot in the upper left is also an example of a curiosity. Its label says that where and when it was carefully uh, collected, 1867 in Thebes. It came to Dartmouth from the beloved Dartmouth Associate Librarian, Harold Rugg, who's there on the right. He was a 1906 Dartmouth Phi Beta Kappa, and you can see his graduation photo on the left. Rugg's main interest was Vermontiana, but he also loved to travel, and he did go to the Near East. We don't really know where he picked up his foot, but are sure that it was, he acquired it because it was a reference to the ancient culture of the Nile. This stick pin on the left, which has a little scarab attached, it belonged to Ernest Fox Nichols, president of Dartmouth from 1909 to 1916. It's another such curiosity. Nichols was a distinguished scientist who took time to in instigate the Winter Carnival and the Alumni Council. Here you see him wearing the stick pin in his official portrait, right there, and that's the detail. I'm sorry to say that the scarab is not ancient, but that's almost beside the point, isn't it, with these small objects of curiosity. It could have been made at Gorna by a villager who was promoting an interest in Egypt too, then sold to a tourist and eventually taken to Britain or America or Europe as a talisman. Miss E.M. Hutton of Reading, England was a bit more lucky with her purchase. She bought a rare 18th Dynasty shroud, which is up here, here in Dartmouth, quite likely on a trip to Egypt. She owned other bits of textiles um, that make you think that she just was collecting what she could from dealers. Parts of the shroud were purchased, this part down here, oops, this part here was purchased by the Berlin Museum in 1912. As a textile, it may have been in pieces when local people found it. So the dealer sold parts of it as he could Many unprovenanced antiquities have been split up like this, providing puzzles for archaeologists like me to work on later. Now, a predecessor of mine at the Metropolitan Museum is this man up here, very famous Egyptologist named William C. Hayes. At one point, Dartmouth asked him to date that little fragment that we just saw on the last slide from the Shroud of Mahu. He's here on a trip to Philae in 1954 with other Egyptologists. Most remarkably, Hayes assigned Mahu's shroud to the Ptolemaic period, that is about 300 BC. But the young man in the upper right, Edward L. B. Terrace, Dartmouth 57, correctly wrote from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston in 1960, that the shroud was really Dynasty 18, more than a thousand years earlier than Hayes had stated. And the man at the bottom, Dartmouth class of 30, and later renowned Egyptologist at Brown University, followed up Terrace to say, yes, Terrace is right, the shroud is about 1450 BC. Now Parker is in the photo below around 1946 with his family at Chicago House Luxor, which was the Oriental Institute Center for Epigraphic Work out of the University of Chicago that was established through the munificence of John D. Rockefeller, Jr. We will hear more of Parker and of Rockefellers in a bit. Terrace himself, the man in the upper right, became an eminent art historian of Egypt, the Near East and the classical world, 
To him, he said later, Dartmouth opened life's door, pointing out the role that education plays in keeping cultures alive. Now, rather than a curio here or curio there, another type of collecting is the cast a wide net approach. A whole suite of things bought at one time that shows a more substantial commitment. And that's what I think happened with the Hitchcock things that are here. That's Hiram Hitchcock on the left and a man named Chesnola on the right. Um, Hiram Hitchcock and his wife, after their beloved son died around 1867, decided to um, take a trip to the Mediterranean. Um, he had intended to come to Dartmouth, but actually got sidetracked and built a hotel business in New York instead. And it was there that he met the man on the right, the, well, shall I say, rogue entrepreneur, Luigi Palma di Cesnola. Cesnola was an Italian immigrant who fought in our Civil War and thereafter gave himself the title of general <laughs> and managed, not with any particular qualifications, to become the American Council in Cyprus after the end of the Civil War. The Hitchcocks, who, um, and Hitchcock himself, um, he was well along in his business career, set sail for the Mediterranean in 1867 with a plan to visit Chesnola in Cyprus while abroad. Um, this is a map, it might be a little bit out of focus, of the Ottoman Empire, just to remind you that the part, when we're talking about Egypt in the 19th century, it was really as part of this larger whole of the Ottoman Empire. This is Cyprus right here where Chesnola was the American Council. And uh, typically, um, travelers at that time would, could cross the Atlantic in a steamer, uh, get a second boat here on the Mediterranean, and would land at Alexandria, which is right here. This is Cairo, and then way up here is going to be Luxor. Um, so the Hitchcock plan was to sail across. They went to Italy, they went to Cyprus, to Egypt, and then they were along the coast up here as well. Before that, before they landed on Cyprus to visit Chesnola, they did stop in Egypt, and like Herman Melville, 10 years earlier, they visited Alexandria, Cairo, and no doubt the pyramids. We know this from letters here at Dartmouth. Now, Alexandria in 1867 was a sleepy port. Although Egypt was opening to Europeans, the Suez Canal was about finished. An opera house would be opened in Cairo, for which Verdi wrote Aida. Melville wonderfully describes his impressions during eight days in Egypt. The bustle of Cairo, the glittering mosques, Splendor and squalor, he writes, gloom and gaiety, too much light and no defense against it. The antiquity of Egypt stamped upon individuals. And at the Sphinx, after seeing the pyramid, all other architecture seems but pastry. There is no evidence of Hitchcock as a collector. And I imagine, considering all the records that we have, that he bought the Egyptian objects in one fell swoop, as he, like Melville, was only in Egypt briefly. A label on this block on the left, for instance, says it came from Thebes, but that's 400 miles south of Cairo. It could have been quite likely in a Kyrene dealer's shop, ready at hand for tourists. In fact, the Block has a very difficult inscription of which there's a detail on the right. And Dartmouth at one point asked John Wilson, who's standing here in the Oriental Institute where he, well, he was director even of it at one point. Again, signaling the role that scholars play in keeping or making the past alive. But now we approach a collector who was serious about art with a capital A. 
This magnificent head of a deity was given by Nelson Rockefeller's family in 1999. Nelson was Dartmouth 1930. Up there on his left is graduation photo. And when the sculpture was given, the Hood understood that Mr. Rockefeller had acquired it on a trip to Egypt in the early 1930s. Nelson was the son of John D. Jr. And thanks to the Rockefeller family archives, I have learned that indeed Will Nelson did, and his bride, embark on a year-long honeymoon after his graduation, and the trip did include Egypt. Here they are in Japan. I'm told, I wasn't aware there were waterfalls there, but that's what the label says. Further, as the son of Abby Rockefeller, who, as Nelson later, had so much to do with the Museum of Modern Art, Nelson had grown up with art. At the age of seven, he had written in a composition book, I would like to have the Sistine Madonna in my dining room. <laughs> I would not sell it for all the money in the world or give it to a museum. It is one of the most wonderful paintings Raphael painted. Of course, we can sense the influence of his mother here, but while at Dartmouth, Carpenter Hall was opened and Nelson did focus on art. One professor wrote, Nelson was very interested in pyramids and went on from there. Alas, but perhaps more interestingly, as I learned from the Rockefeller archives, the piece that sculpture had was not acquired by Nelson, but by his maternal grandfather and namesake, Nelson Wilmarth Aldwych on the right. This document, which is a collection record um, th that's in the archives of the Rockefeller family, says that it was the piece was purchased by Senator Nelson W. Aldridge when he went up the Nile with Mr. Morgan in consultation with Mr. Lithgow of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The collection of Mrs. John D. Rockefeller Jr., that would be Abby, gift to Nelson, her son, and then given to Nelson's first wife, Mary Clark Rockefeller, under separation when they divorced. And it was from her that Dartmouth received the head as a gift from her and her, I think, youngest son. The collection, um, record pointed me right away to this man named Lithgow. First of all, of course, Mr. Morgan up here, which means, um, J. 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 P. Morgan, J. Pierpont Morgan, and Mr. Lithgow, was the founder of the Egyptian department at the Metropolitan Museum where I have worked for many years. Thanks to letters and a diary that I found in the museum from Lithgow and his wife, we can say a good deal more about the acquisition and modern history of this head. Nelson Aldridge was a very powerful politician whose career developed after the Civil War. From about 1870 to 1910, as the senior U.S. Senator from Rhode Island and the head of the Senate, fi Senate Finance Committee, he was referred to as the general manager of the nation. <clears throat> this was a time when the West was opening up and pressuring the Eastern establishment. Fortunes, as in sugar, steel, and banks, were to be made. American industries were developing the question of bimetallism was being hashed out. That is, should the currency be based on gold, as the East wanted, or could it have equal value to silver, as the West wanted? As a business person, Aldridge believed in an economic constituency and following Alexander Hamilton in society as an economic hierarchy. There was a populist movement in those years with William Jennings Bryan and a progressive party, the Occupy Wall Street movement of the day, but business interests wanted none of it. According to a biography of Aldrich, 
He was indeed a hardworking, conscientious elected official whose values of efficiency relied on survival of the fittest. He protected American factories and farms by creating an extensive system of tariffs, but these tariffs also drove domestic prices high. Following the panic of 1907, when J. Pierpont Morgan bailed out the country, as he had in 1895, Aldridge went to Europe to research banking systems to see how things might be better done than they were being done in America. Upon his return, he proposed what would become eventually the Federal Reserve Board. When World War I broke out, he told one of his daughters, that war will last at least three years, and the U.S. can't help but be drawn into it. When asked why, he said, he said, because I have been in Germany and I know her financial condition. What with all that, Mr. Aldrich liked art and went to Europe as often as he could to study and purchase whatever he could. And naturally through business interests as well as the love of art, he became friends with an even more passionate collector, J. Pierpont Morgan the real titan of banking. The two were of similar age, coming to maturity after the Civil War. Morgan was educated in Europe and at Harvard, however. He spoke French and German and was building a really magnificent collection of art in London. In fact, it was Aldrich's sponsorship of a bill to allow fine art into the United States without tax that encouraged Morgan eventually to ship his collection to the United States for the eventual benefit of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Aldrich Bill, in fact, greatly supported the establishment of major museums in this country. Now in 1901, here's Mr. Aldrich and his wife and there are eight children. This daughter is Abby. In 1901, she had married John D. Rockefeller's only son. Thus, the Aldridge and Rockefeller families were joined. Things weren't all rosy, however, in 1901, as that was the year that Ida Tarbell published her critique of the Standard Oil Company, and it called the history of the Standard Oil Company, and in 1914, there would be the Ludlow Massacre. By 1913, both Morgan and Aldrich were disappointed and disillusioned about the way things were going. What with efforts to redo the Monetary Commission bill that Aldrich had guided, they and Rockefeller Sr. had wanted Wall Street to control currency. But Democrats had gotten Congress in 1912 so some governmental oversight was to be included in the bill. It was then in 1913 that Morgan invited Aldridge and his family to sail to Europe in a steamer across the Mediterranean then in a yacht that Mr. Morgan owned and then sail up the Nile in a Dahabia or river boat which Mr. Morgan also owned. Mr. Morgan had been going to Egypt for several years in the company of the Metropolitan Museum's curator, Alfred Albert Lithgow, the man mentioned in the collection record. Two daughters and Mr. and Mrs. Um, Aldridge were on that trip. Now, Mr. Morgan, before 1913, he had developed a great love of Egypt over the years such a contrast, really, from his London home at Prince's Gate, filled with beautiful European art. Here are photos from his 1912 trip. On a Nile Dahabia, there, up near, we're at, near Aswan here. On a do donkey, riding to the, des the tombs in the desert. I mean, obviously, there are no cars then, and if you wanted to travel in Egypt, it was by donkey or by riverboat. Um, and then 
Here, the party is inspecting a temple in Upper Egypt. That I believe this is Mr. Morgan here. Also, 200 miles out into the desert from Luxor at the Karga Oasis, where the Metropolitan Museum was excavating. It had one of its sites there for Roman and early Christian things. Um, he loved going to that place. And uh, at this photo at the upper left, his, with his traveling companions, they formed what they called the Harvard Club of Karga. <laughs> left to right, you see old boys, Herbert Winlock, the Metropolitan's brilliant archaeologist who excavated a beer jar that Horst Dornbusch will probably mention next Tuesday in his event about Egyptian beer. Morgan's doctor, John Kinnicutt, and then Morgan, Bishop Lawrence, John Cadwallader, and the Met's curator, Albert Lithgow. Asked on that trip where he liked to live best, Mr. Morgan said, New York, London, Rome, Carga, and in that order. Other notable personalities in Egypt at that time in 1912 were here in the lower right, Howard Carter, oops, right here, and the Earl of Carnarvon. The two of them would go on to find Tutankhamun's tomb. The Earl's home was Highclere Castle, which some of you might know as the scene of the currently popular Downton Abbey series. Now, thanks to Mr. Morgan, the Metropolitan received this magnificent dig house at Luxor, really quite palatial. This is the interior. Um, it's still standing, but um, it's not in such fine repair today. The Metropolitan gave up its excavations in 1948, but it was finished, the building was finished in 1912, and it was next year, the 13, that Morgan especially wanted Aldridge to see this. I show this because it illustrates the role that patronage has in scholarship. The Egyptian department at the Metropolitan would never have developed without the support of major benefactors. Um, the first one was Mr. Morgan, and after that it was Ed, Ed, Edward Harkness. There have been others since. So patronage is another way that the name of Egypt is kept alive. Now, the trip that the Aldridges made the next year, as it turned out, would be Mr. Morgan's last, as he died on the return trip in Rome. This photo was taken in Spain on the trip out. Mr. Aldridge is here in the background, I would say looking with some concern at Mr. Morgan because he was, it was already known that he was not feeling well. But he had also, Mr. Morgan had just been had just finished being grilled in the Senate, in Senate hearings led by Sam Untermeyer about the role Morgan had played in various financial transactions. According to the documents in the Met's Egyptian department, chronicling their trip, the Aldridge party consisted of Senator Mrs. Aldridge and the two daughters. She was actually the mother of six, of five of her six children by then one of whom was Nelson. In Cairo, which is where the top two photos were taken, they stayed at Shepherd's for a few days, and these are photos taken on the street in front of Shepherd's. Um, I don't know if this is clear for you, but I'm hoping. This is Shepherd's up in here. Um, there are other major hotels around here and banks, and then this is the museum. Um, this is the square, which is now called um, uh, Square Liberty Square, let's say, in Arabic. And um, that's where the revolution a year ago began. The Nile is right here. So travelers would arrive 
from Alexandria by rail, railroad is up, stations up here somewhere, they would settle in here. And typically right around here would be dealers stores as well as banks. Um, there's one in this photo right here, which could have been the one where the hood head was purchased. Because as it turned out, the party could only be in the major cities of Cairo and Luxor before Mr. Morgan had to return to go back, to, he hoped, to America. And I think it's most likely it happened at the beginning of the trip when they were still a little bit more at ease um, that it would have been in Cairo. The opera is also the, uh, in this district up here. Eventually the head went home. Um, this is a photo from the Rockefeller collection record uh, archive again. This, I'm sorry to say, this doesn't really show very well, but it is this same red marble base. The base itself indicates a certain aesthetic, somebody dealing with art with a capital A, and also a certain period of collecting. Today, our sensibility um, is different, and we prefer to just to focus on the ancient object without this decorative uh, item enhancing it. So it went back to Mr. Aldrich's house, probably the one on Narragansett Bay, um, and um, it probably as a memento of the trip. Mr. Aldrich did collect widely, but this is the only Egyptian thing we know that he had. Certainly Aldrich owed the ownership of this head to his friendship with Mr. Morgan, and Morgan's debt was to Lithgow. They, in fact, were quite close. Aldridge died two years later. The head went to Abbey, and it was displayed in a Rockefeller home until it was given to Dartmouth in 1999. In the 1940s, we switched back again to the curiosities, Men not mentality, but uh, such kind of situation of acquisition. This mummified fish in the upper left came to Dartmouth from two dealer brothers in Alexandria. You see on the right, Dartmouth President Ernest Hopkins, Dartmouth class of 1901, the donor of the fish. And with the map here, you can see Alexandria way up here at the base of this delta, which is farmland. It's way up river, it's car, looks or, um, this is a cutout of that map. And over here is the detail that shows this long string of smaller towns around Alexandria. The city of Alexandria was founded by Alexander the Great at the western tip of the delta and faced the Mediterranean. It was known always as a city that looked to the sea. By 1940, mid-40s, actually 1944, one world war had passed and a second one was ending you can see Alamein here as the site of a famous battle of the Second World War. Egypt was under British rule, but the city, as always, was international and to some degree used to the vagaries of life. So uh, this is a, oops, this is a photo of Alexandria at that time. And we start with this letter up here, which was written from the Khan Khalil, which, which turns out is the name of the shop, to the president, Board of Regents, Dartmouth College, 1944. I mean, I think it's amazing that they found Dartmouth's address and addressed themselves to um, the president. Um, in the next letter on the right, um, well, in the first letter, actually, they asked whether Dartmouth could be interested in purchasing an embalmed fish of which there was a limited number, a reply was requested by return mail. By the following April, President Hopkins had offered personally to pay $25 for the fish. <laughs> and the Anawat brothers, one of who, whom signs his name here, wrote that it would soon be shipped. After giving some possibly true information about provenance, they continued in the letter. 
are you interested in embalmed hawks? We have some specimens that are bandaged in a most artistic way. The main Anawat shop was here in the Rue Fuad, although there was a bazaar-like outpost in, called the Fleet Club where servicemen gathered. The Rue Fuad, again, you might not be able to read this, but it's this major street in here. This is the big harbor. There's a second one. Um, the Rue Fuad was the place that E.M. Forster had met Kafafi, and Lawrence Durrell lived with Eve Cohen in the 1940s, the woman after whom Durrell was to pattern Justine in the Alexander Quartet. Durrell was working for the British Information Office, which I think is it's right here. And this is Durrell with his staff at that time. So there was a mixture of people in Alexandria. It was a different kind of community than Cairo. The Anawats, incidentally, in typical Alexandrian character, were Syrian Christian and had a minor role in the acquisition of the Nag Hammadi codices for any of those who you know about the history of early Christianity. They, to me, point out to the role that dealers have or can have in keeping culture alive. As for Hopkins, the Dartmouth president who personally put up $25 to buy the fish, he was addressed by Governor, Governor Nelson Rockefeller when the Hopkins Center was opened in 1962. I came to Dartmouth because of you. So many wheels, so many connections. Turning again to collecting Egyptian art with a capital A, we come to this wonderful head of a lioness goddess, Sekhmet, and its donor in the lower right, Ray Winfield Smith. Mr. Smith was Dartmouth 1918 and a classmate of Harvey Hood, for whom this museum is named. Smith was a veritable dynamo of energy and accomplishment. Everything from receiving a Purple Heart in World War I to being economic and military advisor to the government after World War II, a Sinclair oil man, pilot, patentee in field directional drilling, and pioneer in cost accounting. He was also an attache to the Olympic Games of 1928. He was the head of the track team here, and he was fluent in six languages. Like Morgan, Smith found art and culture in Europe enticing, although he went to Europe not for business interests as Morgan, but because of war, First World War. From Letters and Rauner, two Dartmouth classmates in 1918, we see that Smith immersed himself in culture abroad, laying a foundation for later business and governmental roles. But he also did unusual things by becoming a collector of ancient glass. He participated in a pioneering project at Brookhaven National Laboratories to provenance ancient glass through lead isotopes. And as director of the American Research Center in Egypt, an administrative post during the 1960s, he got interested in using computers to solve a giant jigsaw puzzle at Karnak. We're here in the temple of Amun at Karnak. This is a large pylon filled with small blocks. This is obviously built later, let's say about 100 years later, with blocks that had been put inside to be used as fill. These blocks were from temples of Akhenaten, who is often referred to as the father of monotheism. They had been walled up in this huge pylon when Akhenaten's reign was termed a heresy. By photographing and documenting these blocks and getting IBM, that would have been about 1967 or 8, to computerize the records, the team turned up evidence that Akhenaten's wife Nefertiti was more than a beautiful woman. She had a major role in the sun cult that Akhenaten promulgated, and by means of evidence that Smith discovered, 
She is now thought by many to have actually ruled as Pharaoh. Not bad for an amateur. Smith, that is. As for the Sekhmet head, a major temple of the goddess was next door to Karnak at Luxor. That's this site, and you can see various statues of the goddess here that have been excavated and placed upright so that you can see amongst the walls that were once much higher, of course, you can see some of these statues. I suggest that, uh, that Smith bought the head while working with the Ignaton Temple Project. Like Aldridge, he collected art widely, but he did have a special interest in ancient art. The final object I would like to trace, the, of, for which I would like to trace the history, is this faience Isis. It's only about six or seven inches high, and I actually gave it in memory of people who had owned it. The first owner was this extraordinary woman on the right, standing in the late 40s with Egyptologist Bernard Bothmer here and Alexander Pionkov, a Russian Egyptologist in the center. The woman in the plaid coat was born Winifred Shaughnessy in Salt Lake City, the granddaughter of Joseph Smith's right-hand man. Wink, as she was called, was raised with both privilege and eccentricity. Her father was Catholic. Her mother was a spiritualist. One of her mother's husbands was the sister of the decorator Elsie DeWolf. Another husband built a cosmetics empire. Winifred was sent to English boarding school at eight. At 17, she ran off from there and joined the Imperial Russian Ballet and changed her name to Natasha Rambova. Within a few years of that, she was in Hollywood where she designed these gorgeous costumes and set, sets for the silent film actress and director, Ala Nazimova. Nazimova was the aunt of the later writer-director Val Luton. That's Nazimova right here. And she introduced Rambova to Rudolf Valentino. The two of them are on your right. Rambova became Valentino's second wife. But more than that, her intelligence and style are credited with creating, creating the persona of Valentino. Alas, that phase of Rambova's life ended, and during the 30s, she was married to a Spanish count. Initially holding a conservative view in the Spanish Civil War, her political thinking did change, but in the end, it was Franco who helped her escape the country and that marriage. While married to Orthias, however, she made her first trip to Egypt, and there she wrote, I felt as if I had at last returned home, returning to a place once loved after too long a time. In the 1940s, she read widely and amassed a formidable library in various languages of which she was fluent. She read in astrology, mythology, dream analysis, and comparative religion above all. By 1948, she got a grant from Paul and Mary Mellon's Bollingen Foundation, which had been set up to further studies related to Carl Jung's work. Rambova's interest was cosmology, the wisdom of the universe that lay behind organized religion. And although that she recognized that she had not been conventionally trained as an Egyptologist, she nevertheless believed that her iconological research was valid, penetrating regions that more pragmatically trained Egyptologists were reticent to explore. Through a second Bollingen grant, she and the Russian Egyptologist Alexander Pionkov that we saw in that first photo, she and Pionkov recorded and published texts in royal tombs, these texts trace the king's journey through the netherworld, that is, after he leaves this life. She was editor. This is one of those uh, royal tomb paintings on the ceiling that shows the sun as it goes through 
the body of the goddess, the sky goddess. New, during the night, these are various um, deities or semi-deities and texts that the king would meet during his journey. She was editor of this series of about five imp very important volumes Bollingen published, but she also wrote a chapter on the metaphysical interpretation of what we call the mythological papyri. In other words, she developed enough credible knowledge to co correspond with Richard Parker in the lower right. We saw him early on when he's the one that said that that little shroud of Mahu really, the terrace really was right. Um, he was a distinguished professor at Brown University and he was the specialist really in Egyptian astronomy, let's say, whatever you want to call this, these, these schemes that document the netherworld. He's here with one of his volumes illustrating a photograph from a Ramesside star clock. She was able to correspond with Parker um, and um, she, um, she was highly interested, partly she corresponded with him because she was so interested in the zodiac. Now, I first heard of Rambova from this man. He was my professor, Donald P. Hansen, Dartmouth, 1953. Here he stands in front of the Dartmouth Assyrian Reliefs, holding a book on the Assyrian Reliefs in the Metropolitan Museum. The book was written by, of the Metropolitan's Relief, Reliefs was written by this woman, the eminent great Near Eastern scholar, Edith Parada. At Dartmouth, Hansen was a student of the classicist John Stearns, who's right here, and together they wrote the guide of 1953 to the Assyrian reliefs. 55 years later, that is just a few years ago in 2007, professors Cohen and Kangas dedicated papers from a symposium on the reliefs to Hansen. It was while the young Dartmouth student was on a trip to New York that Hansen met Parada. She had dropped papers on a bus and he helped her pick them up. Parada was a refugee from Austria. She's, this is actually her home in, in, uh, outside of Vienna, whose first job had been in America at the Bollingen Foundation and she knew Rambova and knew that Rambova wanted research help for the studies that she, Rambova, was undertaking. Hansen was beginning graduate studies at Harvard. Parada introduced the two on the steps of the 42nd Street Library. He told me that and he said he eventually formed a close relationship with this extraordinary woman, Miss Rambova. In fact, I think his knowledge of Egypt must have been developed in large part because of Rambova's great involvement with the subject. What kind of collectors were Rambova and Hansen? She was interested in objects for what they could say about Egyptian belief. He, as a scholar and archaeologist, was drawn further into aesthetics. The little green Isis that I illustrated was in his office for many years I think at hand is a memory of Miss Rambova. Here is Hansen on the left in the early 70s in his beloved Iraq. The reed mudifs in the background are an architectural form that was used since Sumerian times, actually until Saddam Hussein drained the marshes of the Gulf. Hansen was a brilliant archaeologist. He's here with some of his workmen and a first-rate teacher, and it points, I think he, uh, his involvement points to the serendipitous nature of connections that people form with antiquity. So, on this kind of whirlwind tour of the world of collecting, we have seen a variety of collectors, uh, of ways that people approach objects, whether it's as curio, memento, high art, jigsaw puzzle that could reveal new historical facts, souvenir, all of these people have kept interest in Egypt alive. So thank you, hope you found it interesting too. <laughs>
questions, yeah? If there are any questions. We do have Horst to Dornbush tonight with us. Kathy? Um, so what's the most surprising thing to you that you found out or looking at this question? What's some of the things, something you came across well, that you didn't expect? Oh, this, in, this, in this segment of it, I was really impressed how few people were involved, how they knew each other, or that there were <coughs> names or you know, associations that kept turning up. Um, and I found it very interesting to uh, learn. I mean, I used it really as a chance to learn more about American history, Morgan and Aldridge, and uh, things that, you know, we as each, I mean, 1912 was when the Titanic went down. 1912, I know about as an archaeologist because I know who was excavating where and what they were digging up, but I never connected it with the other bigger events in the world. Uh, and so for me, that was, it was a pleasure to be able to, to do that. Yes? Um, from how far away were objects being brought to Alexandria and Cairo to be marked as tourists? And to what extent does that disrupt the problems? Disrupt what? Problems. Oh, it does entirely. I mean, Mr. Hitchcock had about um, 150 objects, and only four of them have something written on the back that says where they came from. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, it's extraordinary to me that Melville would only spend eight days in Egypt. Um, he wrote wonderfully. He was very impressed. He loved it. But he had only booked or maybe only had time for that much of a, of a trip. Um, I think what... Nowadays, we, if you see an object that's without provenance, you can't assume where it might have come from. It could have definitely been purchased in Alexandria and um, been come from far upriver because that's where the tourists, you know that everybody was going to land there. Or in Cairo, where most people at least would go to see the pyramids. Yeah. Well, I love the fish. You know I love the fish. So I wanted to make sure I understood the beginning of the fish story. Because it sounded like these antiquities dealers in Alexandria did the ascent, did the equivalent of a cold call. Is yeah. that right? They yes. just they wrote just, randomly? To as Dartmouth. I say, I, I, it's really interesting to me that they knew to write to Dartmouth College, and they wrote precisely to the president, the Board of Regents. I mean, they must have seen some kind of document that had those, um, you know, that listed, that was 1944. The mixed courts were in Alexandria. There was a very cosmopolitan center. I mean, there could have been somebody living in Alexandria who would come back to New York or who was a Dartmouth graduate, for all we know, who had things in his library or who, you know, that these dealers could access in some way. It was a small community. Um, but there it is. They And I mean, when I was curator, I would get letters from all over people thinking that, oh, the Met must want something like this. Yeah. So, um, and at first I, th I thought I mean, nobody had ever heard of these dealers. And Debbie Haynes helped me try to find um, anything about them. Uh, it took me quite a long time to even find who they were. But then it became quite interesting because the, a brother of theirs was a major um, church figure, um, I think in the Dominican order, and he had a major role in the acquisition of the Naga Hamadi Hakodises. The brother is only a little tangential role, but you can't tell who's going to have something really important, or you know, it could be a really minor dealer that somehow gets hold of something that is, is important. Uh, do you think there's any benefit to um, scholastic collecting or antiquities trading, or do you think it's just wholly detrimental by promoting the illicit antiquities trade? Well, um, I think uh, the acquisition of objects is is complicated. Um, I mean, pers I would have loved everything to stay in Egypt and to be all the sand cleared away and the monuments reconstructed and preserved and safeguarded and all of us could look at them, but that certainly isn't the reality of things. Um, um, and I do think that 
in teaching collections and in universe in even non-teaching regular museums, uh, the larger public institutions, um, there's a definite role that museum curators generally take very seriously of trying to teach from these objects. What I object to actually is to see the object out of context because, you know, it's, it has a totally different feel or impression if you see it in the environment with a s strong sunlight and with the sand or with the Nile or whatever. So I think we miss all that by going into a museum, but we study other aspects. You know, when you have the object, you're bound to examine it more closely and you get much more out of it than you would if you just see a whole country filled with, with things. Um, yes? Earlier in your slideshow, you showed a uh, object that you said had a strange inscription. It was part of a... Mm -hmm. Could you comment? Well, it's, it's not a strange inscription. It's dif very difficult to read it because of its, it's a soft sandstone and the sculptor didn't carve it that precisely. So we know it's a Ptolemy, which means, oops, sorry about that. Um, it means that it is somewhere 330 BC or later when the Ptolemies ruled. And, um, but we can't really say Oops, I'm trying to shut this down. We can't really say which Ptolemy because they would repeat, part of their names would be repeated. Um, and John Wilson from Chicago, who was the first person to ask, uh, that was asked to translate it, suggested like three different Ptolemies it could be. Most recently, the, the expert today um, said it can't be those three, it's, you know, but it can, might be four others, you know, so we haven't gotten any further along. But, you know, more and more as things are computerized in their data banks, um, the information is c collected and searched better, and so um, I think eventually maybe, I'd like to find the temple it's from, and I haven't been able to do that so far. Okay. Um. Well, I think it's pretty grim. Um, the person you might, many of you might have seen this man, Zahi Awas, who was the um, person on Discovery Channel often. Um, he really, uh, he was trained here at Penn and he was very, he's very bright and he worked very hard. Um, but he was appointed by Mubarak and he left with Mubarak. So since then there hasn't been any big personality to take over. A couple of people have been put in charge and they left. Um, a big problem is security without police. I mean, a police state does keep the police, <laughs> does keep some order. And um, the choice they have is just to lock everything up at this point as much as they can. And so um, I was last in Cairo about two years ago, and I feel really very lucky for, to have gotten the information I did because I think it's going to be some time before scholars would be able to get information from the museum. They just cannot open cupboards and cannot even, I mean, you just don't know where it's all going to lead, so they don't want to lose their jobs, and they're being very careful about how they maintain things. Um, as far as the sites go, I understand that, um, that people can work, um, but, uh, you know, it's all so unsettled. You really don't know about the future, and certainly, you know, there's great, still great, great poverty in Egypt. So people know that the archaeologists go there and dig things up, and so they think, oh, they must have gold. That's why they're doing it. So as soon as the archaeologists leave, they tr go and, well, they'll only find masonry, which means something to us, but it doesn't mean anything for sale in the big market. So whole tombs have been destroyed, which really shouldn't, didn't need to have been, but there weren't guards there who could secure things. and. 
that's all very d discouraging to the people who excavate. We're glad for what's here. <laughs> okay.